Welcome to another installment of Monday q and I hope you've all had a fantastic, legendary weekend. Thank you to everybody who submitted a question for this week's Q&A video. And as always, if you have a question that you'd like me to answer on next week's video, simply put it in the comment section below. A massive shout out to all the amazing people who support me over on Patreon. They keep the lights on in this studio. They keep my cats fed and they make it so much easier to do what I do here on YouTube. If you'd like to sign up and get access to some exclusive content, my Patreon is linked in the video description. Furthermore, you can listen to some of the music that I make with my band Ragdoll. It's linked in the video description. For now, let's dive into this week's questions. The damn show has just come and gone. What are some pieces of gear that excite me? Uh, before I talk about this, I have to give a shout out to friend of the channel, Alessio, who was able to go to the show and take so many photos. He posted them up on my Discord, which is linked in the video description if you want to check it out. And basically, it seems like he went to every single interesting booth on there. So it's kind of like being a fly on the wall there. And to my student, Drew, who was able to go there, hopefully those two were able to meet up and uh, just complain about me the whole time. But I digress. For me, the main products that were exciting weren't necessarily new guitars. I'm more into the like amps and effects side of things. So the Synergy 20 watt lunchbox head with IR loading, we talked about that on the gear podcast. And I think we did a pretty good job of predicting all the features on there. That one looks great. And that's one that I definitely want to try out. The Two Notes Genome plugin as well looks very, very slick. The fact that they've got neural amp modeler capture support on there as well with a super slick GUI. I think a lot of people are gonna be super into that one. The Palmer Supreme Soaker, which I actually have here. I'm gonna be doing a demo with it over the next couple of weeks. But that really, really interests me because I'm really into 80s guitar players and their massive rigs. And it seemed like every other player had some kind of Palmer speaker simulator attenuator in their rig. And that one has a whole lot of extra features on there that I think make it really, really interesting. The fact that you can attenuate up to 150 watts is very interesting. So you'll be seeing and hearing more of that. The other one that I wanted to mention as well is the Alex Lifeson Lurkst guitar. There was the video that he did with Chris Shiflett from the Foo Fighters where he kind of had a red one. I think a lot of people were going, finally, the Hentor Sportscaster is going to be in production. And well, I guess finally, the Hentor Sportscaster is in production. It's just 4000 American dollars manufactured by Godin who do some good stuff. But my impression of Godin has always been that they're kind of really, really good value for the money that their stuff isn't priced super high, but you get high levels of detail and craftsmanship on there. So that was the thing that really surprised me. I thought that might be like a two, two and a half thousand US dollar price point guitar on there. The specs do look great on there. Having the option to have either a Floyd Rose or the Vega Trem is really, really cool. I'm just glad that they did it. But at that price, I think a lot of enthusiasts, uh, myself included, might just kind of look at, say, getting some Warmoth parts and buying a Lawrence pickup and a Vega trim and some locking tuners and slapping a uh, kind of DIY Hentor Sportscaster together, which is a really interesting thing that I've thought about for a long time. If you'd like to see a kind of Warmoth or parts build for something like that, I've been stopping myself from going down that super deep rabbit hole with it. But Maybe 2024 is the time that I can just kind of build my dream, like moving pictures, permanent wave style guitar rig at some point. Let me know if you'd like to see that or let me know if you think the price on the Lurkst is totally justified given it's made in Canada and given Alex's status as an absolute guitar god. And some of the interviews that I've seen have been really, really interesting as well. It's kind of hard not to love Rush and hard not to love Alex. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. So I mentioned the Synergy Lunchbox head. This question comes from Music of Dreamweaver and he wants to know, what are my thoughts on a Synergy setup versus having separate heads? It's an interesting comparison because getting a lot of tube heads that are maybe good at one or two specific tasks and collecting Synergy modules, each of which are maybe good at one or two specific tasks, kind of feels like exploring the whole gas thing in slightly different ways. One thing that the Synergy system has in its favor to me is so many amps are just like a modified Marshall or a modified kind of Soldano SLO thing with maybe some boosts and some extra switches in there. So having a common power amp and one of the Synergy 
module loaders and just being able to swap out modules or buy up modules, you know, whether you buy the modules new or whether you get them secondhand, they are cheaper than buying an entire new amp. And you're also kind of locked in to a power amp and all the other modules in there. That's the reason I like it. And I find just the kind of vanilla Synergy branded modules are really good, the TDLX and the 800. I probably use the most. The Bogner Ubershaw module is awesome. The 2CP, the 5150. But much like a lot of heads, there is a lot of overlap with those modules. So I would say if you went down the Synergy route, try to get things that really complement one another. For example, if you've got the Uber, having the 800 makes sense, but maybe having the 5150 doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You could get something like a Fender flavored module like the TDLX or the B-Man or the ODS style module that they do in there. So that is a real benefit of that. But again, it has a lot of similarities to just kind of like lots and lots of overdrive pedals that do similar things. You're like, ah, oh, it's only a few hundred bucks. I'll get another one of those things. And, you know, it covers 80% of the same tones. Whereas if you've got standalone amps, well, having a common power supply for the preamp and the power amp is definitely a thing, especially for amps that derive some of their character from the power section in there. But amps take up a lot of space. They smell really good and they sound really, really great, but they take up a lot of space in that setup. So. I would say it depends what you want. If you're looking to build a really big collection and kind of tick all the boxes when it comes to sounds and you know having all the classic amps and some cool new stuff that inspires you, then obviously collecting the amps is great. If you're somebody who primarily wants the sounds but you want them compact and portable, I think the Synergy would be the way to go. This one comes from Guitar Gears 4544. They want to know, do I have a DI box? And kind of what's the point of having a DI box? I do have a Little Labs Red Eye DI and reamper here in my studio that I talked about in my studio tour video a couple of weeks ago. I love that thing. I primarily use it for recording guitar DIs and for reamping. It's just very, very good at what it does. If you're somebody who has a modeler like, I don't know, any of the small kind of pedal sized very basic modelers like the Iridium or the Walrus ACS, they often only just have quarter inch outputs that are unbalanced on them. So if you want to have a really long cable run and you want to plug into a mixer that only accepts mic inputs, you will need a DI. So essentially you're changing the impedance. What that lets you do basically is have really long cable runs. So you're not going to lose signal, especially in most venues where you'll be on the stage and there'll be a snake and a really long snake goes out to the desk. I mean, imagine this in an arena setup, for example, where the cable runs are going to be incredibly long. Having a long cable run with something that's just got like a guitar jack output is going to get pretty lossy. And also there's a risk of introducing hum and noise in there. Having the ability to lift the ground and flip the phase is another thing that a decent DI does as well. I don't carry a DI around with me when I go on gig because most venues and any decent sound guy will carry around a bunch of DIs, but also my Fractal has DI outputs on it, which are very, very handy on there. So that's the basic function of a DI. They're like the, I don't know, they're like the socks and jocks of the audio world. You just Keep them around. You keep a spare pair in your car because who doesn't? You never know when disaster is going to strike. This one comes from patron and friend of the channel, Freddie. Freddie wants to know my thoughts on the PRS SE McCarty 594. I've not played the SE version, Freddie, but I have played the core version, which is a mind blowingly awesome guitar. If you want that vintage Gibson thing, but you don't want any of the downsides of a vintage Gibson, that's a guitar to get if you've got the money. Now, if the SE is anything like the SE DGT or Swamp Ash, I'm sure it's going to be very, very impressive. The SE DGT that I've got compares so well to my core DGT. They have a slightly different vibe and feel, but I feel like for the money, they've captured the really important essence of those guitars. So if the SE 594s do that, probably a good way to get that kind of vibe and feel going on. Which leads me into my next question related to kind of the vintage Gibson thing. Last week we talked about Les Paul style guitars and the point was raised that if it doesn't say Gibson on the headstock and it's not made in the Gibson factory, it's not really a Les Paul. Which kind of brings up the question of like, well, what really is a Les Paul, you know? The original Gibson instruments 
from the 50s, are they really the only things that can be considered Les Pauls? The original 1961 Les Paul SG, where Gibson just kind of changed the guitar completely without consulting Les, apparently, is that a Les Paul? I mean, it says Les Paul on the little thing on the headstock. Uh, the guitars that came out after they hadn't been made for a while in the late 60s, real Les Pauls. Uh, the new Gibsons, real Les Pauls. They have basically nothing to do with the original instruments and the people who made them. Is this a real Les Paul? I mean, look at it. it looks like a Les Paul. Uh, it's actually a Greco on here. And I play this guitar a lot. It's been let's say moderately modified. It's had a refret by Tim at Williams Guitars. I've changed the bridge pickup for a Gibson Dirty Fingers and it's got some new locking tuners on here, but it looks like a Les Paul and it definitely sounds like a Les Paul. It's a very thick, aggressive sounding guitar. Is this a Les Paul? It says Gibson on the headstock, but it's kind of got a weird inlay on there. It kind of looks like it says LT, even though it does say LP, but look at that. What is going on there? This is a late 70s, early 80s, Gibson Les Paul artist that has been heavily modified. The original owner tried to put a Carla tremolo on it. You can hear the cat is starting to get fired up about this trem on here. Maybe it's not a Les Paul, but uh, there was a big crater in there. I've talked about this guitar before, but it's kind of one of a kind. I mean, Gibson manufactured it. People don't love the Norlin era instruments and I've changed everything on here except for the inlays and the wood. But you know, is that a Les Paul? But this starts to get to the point where I think people go, no, that is definitely not a Les Paul. That's a PRS. I mean, sure, it's got the same scale length and it's got pickups that are voiced like Gibson pickups and it's got a maple top on a mahogany body. But, you know, look at the headstock. It doesn't say Gibson on it. That's not a Les Paul. My PRS DGT, which to my ears has some of the best vintage Gibson inspired tones that I've ever heard. I mean, that's definitely not a Les Paul, right? And finally, this guitar that says Gibson on the headstock that is an all mahogany custom copy that my dad made as a replica from a real late 50s Les Paul custom. Where do you draw the line with this stuff is the Les Paul style guitar that Slash played on the first Gunners album that was an amazing Chris Derrick replica. A Les Paul? I mean, for all intents and purposes, it is. Probably the best Les Paul that I've ever played was a Euron and in terms of matching the way they're made, like the 50s guitars, the wood selection, the hide glues, all the details, that Euron is more Gibson than a Gibson these days that you can buy straight out of the factory. So what is the point of this entire rant here? Why do we do these things as guitar players and kind of come up with these semantic exercises in here? I think ultimately what we're looking for as guitar players is some kind of meaningful link between the aesthetics of an instrument and the way that it sounds. And most of us think those two things are highly correlated. And I'm a little bit on the fence. Again, I'm getting groin rash from straddling the fence so hard here. Because Les Pauls and Gibson in particular have had particular golden errors and bad errors, depending on who you talk to, Really what we're looking for as guitar players is, again, that correlation between aesthetics. I want something that passes the test. You know, this is way more of a Les Paul than my PRS single cut. Would I necessarily choose it over my PRS single cut? I think it depends on the mood that I'm in, the music that I'm playing and what I'm going for on here. This is a beautifully put together guitar and it's really inspiring to play. And it sounds awesome as well, but whether the Gibson on the headstock really means Gibson, is kind of a different thing, right? So uh, it makes me think of the novel, The Man in the High Castle. I'm going on this massive kind of tangent here over here, but if anyone has read that book, which I would highly recommend, there's this concept of historicity in it where without giving the plot away, one of the characters essentially manufactures historical fakes so that people can go and purchase them and talk about them. So is the important thing, and this is like the philosophical lemma in there. Is the important thing actually the item? Does the item hold anything special about it? Or is it the idea that we have associated with the item? I'll leave you to all think about that. There's some questions. And I'm not going to say, is this a Les Paul any more times today? But I'll just leave you with that question. You can let me know in the comment section below. You can come and chat on Discord, or if you really feel like it, join the Patreon and write to me directly. Uh, what constitutes an 
authentic guitar to you? Is it the sound? Is it the look? Is it just the idea of it? Or is it all of those things? I'm, my cats are driving each other absolutely crazy right now. So I'm going to pull up stumps here. Have a great week, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning into the video. And I'll see you next time. Hey, Nagini, what's your favorite Les Paul? What do you think about these things? Whoa, there it is. There's a cat butt.